Thank you, um, Stephanie. I'll be taking the land acknowledgement. CCU would like to begin by acknowledging the indigenous peoples of all the lands we are on today. While we meet today on a virtual platform, I would like to take a moment to acknowledge the importance of the lands which we each call home. We do this to reaffirm our commitment and responsibility to improving relationships between nations and to improving our understanding of local indigenous peoples and their cultures. From coast to coast to coast, we acknowledge the ancestral and unceded territory of all the Inuit, Métis, and First Nations people that call this land home since time immemorial. We seek to acknowledge the arms and mistakes of the past and to consider how we can each in our own way try to move forward in a spirit of reconciliation and collaboration. We further encourage everyone to continuously learn about the cultural vibrancy and value of diversity while on learning the harmful practices of colonization. To learn more, wherever you are in your journey, we recommend visiting our reconciliation page at www.ccua.com forward slash reconciliation. I'm becoming more familiar with the 96 calls to action from the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. I'll now pass it over to Victoria Main Price, who is our Director of Legal Policy and Compliance and Assistant Company Secretary here at CCUA. Over to you, Victoria. Oh, Lou, thank you. And again, uh, good afternoon to everyone on this, on this webinar and welcome to the launch of the guide, Cooperating for a Sustainable Future, Canadian Credit Unions and Effective Climate Governance, which was developed by CCUA and the Canadian Climate Law Initiative, CCLI, and was written by Helen Tews, a doctoral candidate at Peter A. Allard School of Law at UPC. The guide reflects many months of research and preparation, beginning last summer when CCUA and CCLI discussed options for collaboration, though it included CCLI's support of our 2022 CUDA Climate Governance Series and our co-development of this guide for credit unions. For many years, CCUA has supported our sector by raising awareness of and providing support to our members in community impact, ESG, and sustainability. A few years ago, at CCUA's 2020 annual general meeting, a member resolution was adopted to establish a working group that would explore the emerging issue of climate-related financial disclosure. That working group has progressed and is now known as the Climate Action Working Group. It includes representatives from credit unions across our sector, and it operates under our Community Impact Committee. The Climate Action Working Group meets regularly throughout the year to discuss and plan climate-related initiatives and events, to support our sector in understanding and integrating climate-related risks and climate risk disclosure, and to help identify business opportunities for our credit union sector in transitioning to a low carbon environment. Uh, the guide is designed specifically to support our sector in those areas by helping credit union directors and management better understand the role of the board and its duties of oversight regarding climate-related risk and opportunities, the types of climate-related risks and opportunities that credit unions should be focusing on, and some steps for effective governance of those risks and opportunities. Today, I'm delighted to be joined by Sonia Lee Trottier, the Director of Climate, the Canadian Climate Law Initiative. She leads CCLI strategic planning, partnerships, and their board program. She works closely with C-level executives, corporate directors, and pension fiduciaries to support their board program. I'm also joined by Helen Tews, the guide's author. Helen is a doctoral candidate with the University of British Columbia, as I previously mentioned, and an affiliated research scholar with the CCLI. She's going to give an overview of the guide itself and then present, uh, participate in our moderated panel discussion. Also participating in that moderated panel discussion are Christy Stevenson, the executive, executive director of the Peter H. Dillon Center for Business Ethics at UBC Sauter School of Business, who also serves on the boards of Van City and Central One. Also, Jody Fickner, the Chief Impact and Marketing Officer at Sunshine Coast Credit Union. Jody currently chairs the Credit Union's Community Enrichment Committee. She acts as a management resource and a chair to SCCU's board and executive level environmental, social, and governance committees. And she contributes alongside system colleagues through our Climate Action Working Group. And also finally, my colleague Balu, uh, CCUA's Manager of Community Impact and ESG, who is responsible for identifying community impact and ESG issues that are pertinent to our sector 
for providing policy advice and support to advance our members' distinct social, environmental, and economic impact. As I mentioned, following the panel discussion that we're going to have with Christy, Jody, Helen, and Ballou, um, we'll provide some thoughts on how climate, climate governance can help credit unions start their climate journey, how they can promote sustainability, and how they can manage climate-related risks and opportunities. So after that, there will be an opportunity for questions from the audience. With that, I'll pass things over to uh, Sonia Lee from CCLI to introduce CCLI and its work. Thank you. Thank you, Victoria. Good afternoon and good morning, everyone. I'm pleased to be here to discuss how Credit Union can start their climate governance journey and implement best practices. So the Canada Climate Law Initiative, CCLI, is an initiative housed at the University of British Columbia and York University. We provide businesses and regulators with climate governance guidance so they can make informed decision as we move towards a net zero economy. We were very delighted to collaborate with CCUA on this guide, and we hope it will help you to enhance your oversight of climate risk and opportunities. I'll now pass it to Helen, who will share key insights from the guide. Thank you, Sonia Lee. Okay, let me just share my screen. Okay, good afternoon and welcome everybody. Uh, I'm here to present a comprehensive guide that focuses on the key findings surrounding climate governance for credit unions um, and their directors as part of a collaboration between the CCUA and the CCLI. So this guide delves into the legal landscape surrounding climate change and emphasizes the importance of understanding directors' duties, cooperative principles, and the profound effects of extreme weather events on climate union members. It also sheds light on the physical and transition risks associated with climate change, whilst offering practical suggestions for boards, oversight, and stresses the importance of engaging with members to align with credit unions' commitments with a transition towards a sustainable economy. By embracing climate governance, credit unions can effectively contribute to the transition towards net zero, whilst ensuring the well-being of their members. Recognizing their fiduciary duty under provincial legislation to act in the best interests of the credit union, directors have a responsibility to address climate risks and opportunities and should seek guidance to ensure they fulfill those duties. The most valuable aid to directors um, in incorporating climate governance strategically into the credit union they serve is OSFI's guideline B15, which calls for proactive measures in addressing climate related risks and opportunities in financial institutions. Although not directly relevant to credit unions at the moment, the expectation that provincial regulators will follow suit means that the close consideration of this guideline and other evolving regulatory expectations can help directors ensure that their credit unions are well prepared to navigate those changes effectively in the future. So, pardon me, as extreme weather events such as flooding, wildfires and heat waves continue to impact communities across Canada, Credit union members face significant challenges. Climate change is no longer a distant concern or a peripheral issue. It has become a central factor that affects every aspect of our lives. Credit unions, as trusted financial institutions deeply rooted in their communities, have a responsibility to address climate change strategically and proactively. The need for strategic change in credit unions to tackle climate change is imperative for several reasons. The first is risk management. By adopting a strategic approach to climate governance, credit unions can effectively identify and mitigate the physical and transition risks posed by climate change, while saving, safeguarding their financial stability and protecting the interests of their members. Number two is business continuity. By assessing the potential impacts of climate change on their operation, credit unions can develop adaptive strategies that mitigate risks and seize opportunities and maintain their relevance in an evolving financial landscape. Number three is member expectations. So today's credit union members, particularly the younger generations, are increasingly conscious of environmental and social issues. They expect their financial institutions to share their values and act responsibly towards the planet and society. By embracing climate governance as a strategic priority, credit unions can meet the evolving expectation of their members and demonstrate their commitment to sustainable and responsible finance. 
The strategic alignment fosters stronger membership relationships, enhances trust, and attracts a whole new generation of environmentally conscious members. So number four is regulatory environment. Governments and financial regulators are recognizing the urgent need to address climate-related risks. Although not all credit unions are mandated in this regard, the proactive adoption of strategic approach to climate governance means that credit unions can get ahead of the curve that not only ensures that regulatory compliance, but also demonstrates a commitment to good government governance and risk management. Number five is competitive advantage. A strategic focus on climate governance can provide credit unions with a competitive advantage to differentiate themselves from traditional banks by developing innovative financial products and services that support the transition to a sustainable economy. And number six is environmental stewardship. Credit unions have a unique opportunity to become leaders in environmental stewardship with their communities. By integrating climate governance into their strategic planning, credit unions can actively contribute to reducing greenhouse gas emissions, supporting renewable projects, and financing sustainable businesses. This strategic commitment to the environment and environmental stewardship aligns with the cooperative principles and community-focused approach of credit unions and further strengthens their bond with members and the community. Okay, so physical and transition risks pose significant challenges and require credit unions to take proactive measures to ensure the well-being of their members and the long-term viability of the institution. Climate change has resulted in an increase in extreme weather events such as hurricanes, floods, wildfires and heat waves. These events can have devastating consequences on individuals, communities and businesses, including credit, credit union members. Homes and businesses can be damaged or destroyed, livelihoods can be disrupted, and lives can be at risk. The financial implications are also substantial to credit unions and their members. Damage to properties, defaults on loans, and increased insurance costs directly impact the credit union's balance sheets. Moreover, credit union members who suffer from these events may experience financial hardship affecting their ability to meet loan obligations, make deposits, or seek financial services. As trusted financial institutions, credit unions must be prepared to assist their members during these difficult times and develop risk management strategies to mitigate the financial impact to both members and the credit union itself. Transition risks, on the other hand, arise from the shift towards a towards not <laughs> towards a low carbon economy as countries worldwide commit to reducing greenhouse gas emissions and transitioning to sustainable practices industries are undergoing significant transformations this transition presents both challenges and opportunities for credit unions and their members one of the key transition risks is the potential devaluation of assets tied to high carbon industries as the world moves towards decarbonization, assets such as fossil fuel reserves or infrastructures may become stranded, losing their value. Credit unions must assess the exposure to these sectors and develop strategies to manage potential financial losses. This may involve diversifying investments into low carbon sectors or supporting businesses that contribute to a sustainable economy. Credit unions play a vital role in financing re renewable energy, energy efficiency, and sustainable infrastructure projects, and supporting their, their members to transition to sustainable practices. So credit unions are uniquely placed to turn these risks into opportunities. By actively addressing physical and transition risks, they can strengthen their relationships with members, they can build trust and develop and demonstrate the commitment to sustainability and resilience. By offering financial products and services that support climate mitigation and adaptation and efforts, credit unions can play a pivotal role in helping their members navigate the challenges of climate change and seize the opportunities presented by the transition to a sustainable economy. So whether credit union boards are at the early stage of integrating climate governance or already engaged in climate related effective governance techniques and initiatives, this guide provides valuable resources and hopes to help credit unions think about their climate governance journey by providing a set of comprehensive assessment questions. However, for those just starting out, five starting questions are provided and they are, do directors comprehend their obligations to the credit union regarding climate related risks and opportunities? It's crucial for directors to have a clear understanding of their duties and responsibilities concerning climate related issues. This question aims to gauge the director's awareness and comprehension of those obligations. 
Number two, does the board have a plan for integrating climate change into the credit union strategy towards sustainable economy? This question emphasizes the need for a proactive approach to incorporating climate change considerations into the credit union's long-term strategy. Number three, oh, we've got number four too, sorry about that. Does the board have a process in place for consulting with members on their strategy towards a sustainable economy? The question highlights the importance of engaging with members to ensure the alignment and transparency. Number four, has the board appointed an executive with primary responsibility for managing climate related risks and opportunities? And how frequently does the manager provide updates to the directors? Effective governance requires designated individuals who take the lead in managing climate related risks and opportunities. Moreover, it's essential that the appointed executive frequently provides updates to the board of directors. And number five, has the board established a strategy to identify, handle and communicate climate related risks and opportunities, as well as a plan for tra transitioning towards a sustainable economy and a net zero finance emissions by 2050? So this question focuses on the board's strategic approach and whether it includes a robust plan for transitioning to that sustainable economy and realistic targets for achieving net zero finance emissions. These assessment questions serve as a critical checkpoint for directors to evaluate the credit union's readiness to navigate the challenges and opportunities presented by climate change. By thoroughly considering these questions, directors can gain insights into the credit union's current position and identify areas of improvement. It is vital for credit unions to be prepared and manage the physical and transition risks associated with climate change through effective risk management strategies, innovation, innovative financial products, and the support of sustainable initiatives. By doing so, credit unions can safeguard the financial well-being of their members, contribute to community resilience, and establish themselves as leaders in sustainable finance. Credit union directors must recognize climate governance as a strategic issue that aligns with cooperative principles and a member-centric focus. By proactively and strategically addressing climate-related risks and opportunities, directors can guide the credit unions towards a resilient and sustainable future, benefiting their members and the communities they serve. The guide emphasizes the importance of climate governance for credit union directors and provides a detailed checklist to conduct a comprehensive evaluation. Utilizing this checklist, directors can ask crucial assessment questions, examine the credit union's practices, and take proactive steps to address climate-related risks while seizing opportunities for a resilient and prosperous future. Thank you. Helen, thank you very much. We'll now uh, start our moderated panel discussion. And a reminder to everyone to please put any questions that you have uh, into the chat and we will get to them after the moderated panel discussion. So to start, first of all, thank you very much to our panelists for joining us today. And Jody, we'll start with you. What has been Sunshine Coast Credit Union's sustainability journey? And what practical tips is your credit union taking regarding climate governance? Yes, thank you so much, Victoria. Good afternoon, everyone. Happy to be here and really coming from that perspective of a small to medium sized credit union. Uh, so our journey really uh, occurred, I guess the start of it was about three years ago when we're formalizing our ESG uh, strategy. And we looked to the UN's Sustainable Development Goal Framework as a beginning. We took the 17 Sustainable Development Goals and we assessed each one according to the biggest largest risk and opportunity to the credit union, but also um, to the communities that we serve. And so when we did that assessment, we ended up with six of the goals that we were going to focus on as a credit union. Climate action was one of those. So uh, from there, we built out our position statements and principles related to each of those goals, including climate action. And then at the same time, we integrated climate and ESG into the functional area of our credit union. So instead of it just being marketing, it was impact and marketing together. So from there, um, we established three layers within the organization from an engagement and an oversight perspective at the board level, the executive level, and then the employee level as well. So at the board level, we have a standing um, ESG board committee whose main responsibility is really about 
the oversight of the risks and opportunities related to ESG and of course climate falls into that. And when the committee identifies a risk such as climate, they refer that risk onto the audit and risk committee at the board level because they're treating it just as any other risk would be treated and integrating that into the risk management framework. So finally, also this committee at the board level uh, is responsible to identify opportunities for learning and development related to ESG and climate. And so they would be recommending to the board which areas we may have gaps in and uh, filling those gaps with speakers and learning and development and courses. So we recently had a couple of speakers come in. One was a climate expert from the Climate Institute and the other was from an insurance company just to really gain some insight from that industry outside of our own. And then uh, the executive committee, it's really uh, made up of the C-suite and its purpose is really to function as a cross-functional way to integrate ESG and climate into the organization. So it's not a standalone silo, it truly is spanning the entire organization, which we find is really important as we approach all of these new challenges and opportunities. And finally, the Climate Action Employee Committee, we wanted to make sure we're engaging and innovating across the entire organization. So the Climate Action Committee um, is made up of five employees and really their focus area is taking the reporting that we're doing and the benchmarking that we're doing um, on, the climate, uh, on the climate side in terms of our own organizational emissions. They're taking that information and then creating ways to improve and decrease our emissions as an organization. So that could be our buildings, uh, employee travel, or it could be paper usage. So taking it to that level. Uh, Sunshine, we are currently assessing ourselves against the TCFD framework, which uh, was referenced many times in Helen's paper. And we're doing this kind of proactively because uh, climate action is one of our main focus areas. And we expect also, of course, our regulator to come um, and advise us on what areas we need to track and measure. Uh, but we thought we'd get a little bit of a jump on that and we're doing that with the vendor that we selected. It's an online platform. Uh, we answer questions related to governance, strategy, risk management and metrics. And then we are assessed against the TCFD framework and how we're doing. And then just lastly, we as an organization, we're doing a lot of things around ESG, but we didn't really have a North Star to look to. And we didn't have a driving force for all of the employees to rally around. And so what we've done is we've taken a step sideways and we are establishing our social purpose. And we're partway through that, that process right now, but we really feel with this social purpose, it's something to rally behind. And that with our ESG work that we're doing will really support that purpose and bring it to life. Jody, thank you very much. Um, that was a, a wonderful perspective on a sustainability journey for a, a sort of small mid-sized credit union and, and from management's perspective. So now, Christy, what has been your board, your board's climate journey uh, at Van City, obviously a much larger credit union, and what practical steps is Van City taking regarding climate governance? Yeah, thanks. Um, and before I, I address that, I just want to say, in case I forget to say it today, just what I really appreciate being here. Uh, this guide is so unbelievably valuable. It is so comprehensive. It is so clear. It is just so useful to people. So I feel like if there's only three words I say today, it's read this guide. <laughs> Actually, anything else is bonus. Um, so yeah, I can talk a bit about uh, Vancey's board journey around climate governance. Um, the interesting thing though, is I've been on the board for three years. And in fact, one of the incredibly striking things about coming into the board um, at Van City is that this journey is decades. I, I mean, Van City is a credit union, which, you know, climate uh, has really been front and center as a governance issue and as an organizational issue for a very long time. I was reading, just to put in some context, um, I was reading an article this morning uh, and it referenced that Van City had done, this is a social, but a social audit in 1997. And as a board member, this is the kind of thing I'm stumbling on all the time, the incredible work that has been done for so long. The fact that climate uh, you know, has really been baked into the DNA of the organization, of the executive uh, team, um, and of the board uh, for a very long time. So uh, in coming into the board, um, 
I'd say, uh, you know, there's really kind of two pieces. One is this long legacy and this real integration. And the other is that, and maybe it's a self-fulfilling prophecy, you know, because Van City is well known for its climate work, it maybe attracts directors who feel strongly about, you know, being really drawn to serving on the board of an organization that has such a, a strong a reputation around climate action. Um, so you end up with a boardroom full of people uh, who really are not talking, you know, we, we, the conversation is not about sort of the why or the business case or, um, you know, whether this is crucial, you know, risk and transition opportunities are crucial, but really, you know, in, into the, the how and the what. Um, and I'd say that really takes a whole bunch of forms. Uh, you know, uh, you know, Jody talked about purpose. Again, you know, the board is really the guardians of the purpose. Um, um, and that is baked into our purpose. Uh, we're really within the climate context uh, guided uh, by the co-op principles um, and particularly around which which Helen talks about, you know, really clearly in the report around commitments to education, training, and information sharing as cooperative principles. It isn't just, you know, we're not a financial institution just selling products. Uh, we have a core responsibility around um, literacy on issues, including climate, um, for our members and our stakeholders. Uh, we, you know, I think that, uh, and, and then the second piece is concern for community, the other principle that ties so obviously to, to climate and responsibilities as directors uh, of a co-op or a, a credit union. Um, then the board really having a clear understanding um, of who our stakeholders are primarily, but not exclusively members, and really what their expectations are and aspirations are for uh, the organization. Um, the board being, you know, the being ultimately responsible for these broad, large scale commitments around net zero and the timing of that. And we've made a whole series of, of commitments. Um, and then, you know, understanding the reputational capital that when you make those commitments, you need to be able to, to uh, you know, you need to execute on them. You need to make sure that, you know, they are in fact uh, viable. Um, and then the board really being involved in strategy, all elements. Again, Helen's got some extremely practical uh, ways boards can be, you know, uh, active around climate discussion in strategy oversight, um, operational oversight, you know, budgeting, assumptions, all the kind of financial pieces uh, that connect uh, to a change in climate. Um, directors sort of being broadly plugged in to a lot of these uh, emerging uh, initiatives, again, being very literate around things like the off-sea, um, uh, uh, off-sea, sorry, uh, guidelines, uh, at B15, the climate risk management. We've just got, um, day before yesterday, the ISB uh, reporting standards that have been announced around sustainability and climate, uh, BCFA, we're in Vancouver, uh, BC, in British Columbia, BCFA, BCFSA's uh, climate work that's coming, um, the work uh, this, just this morning, offices, uh, I'm getting stumbling over that acronym for some reason today, um, draft uh, climate risk returns that are out for consultation, so there's a whole bunch of pieces. And then in terms of like the governance, um, how it's baked in really those are kind of the board's pieces and then the various committees and i'd say they're really all touching uh on elements so audit uh obviously you know looking at climate around assumptions underpinning the financials the oversights of controls uh adequacy disclosure you know we've committed to disclosing finance where we are disclosing financed emissions that is by no means uh simple um internal audit and the work that happens there uh non-financial external auditing how much are we going to actually get external auditing on van city has done that for a long time had external auditing on non-financials including climate uh data uh, the risk committee tracking, you know, uh, measures and toler and developing tolerances, overseeing tolerances, uh, understanding different kinds of climate risk, the, the sort of long and short term, direct and indirect, uh, isolated, systemic, avoidable, mitigatable, residual, things you just can't, that are just on the table, um, macro and, and, uh, and micro, like what does it look, everything from, you know, our, our book of business, our employees, our members, you know, to the really big picture pieces, uh, the governance committee, Advanced City, looking at education sessions, assessing climate capacity of the board, 
um, HR even, you know, we, we believe that when people feel good, employees feel good about places they work and the actions they're taking, particularly, but not only younger people, uh, that is a value proposition uh, to be able to offer meaningful work to people. And so that's helpful in terms of uh, recruitment and retention. Uh, nominations, uh, looking at climate literacy in the skills matrix, um, you know, even we're undergoing a CEO search and what kind of uh, leader do we need uh, that can speak to these issues uh, with credibility and even things like tech, you know, these are none of these committees and none of the work really of the organization are untouched uh, by climate transition uh, considerations, so. Thank you very much, Christy. Um, so there's a lot of information there, uh, certainly the, the OSFI acronym, we have so many acronyms <laughs> in our sector. Um, it's where it's almost as though we're in the military, we have so many. Uh, let's now move, Helen, to your perspective. We've heard from a small to mid-sized credit union, we've heard from a large credit union, but in your perspective, what involvement and role should credit union boards have with respect to setting sustainability strategies and managing climate change risk and opportunities? And I, I know you've talked about it a little bit. Yeah, um, thank you for that, for that question. Um, the short answer is that boards play a central role in leading the direction um, of their credit unions. Uh, I think Jody and Christy both brought it up that, that you're the, the guardians of purpose, that you're the, the drivers of purpose as, as directors. Um, boards need to be leading their credit unions on this journey. They need to have this conversation with management, with their members to ascertain where they are on this journey um, and then really take proactive steps to get informed about climate related risks and the opportunities that affect the credit union. Um, and then really the role that the credit union can take within their communities and for their members as well. I think that's really um, one of the central points of a credit union um, is that you support your members and you support that community and taking those steps to to lead your credit union in the direction to speak to to your members especially having that conversation and knowing the best ways to support them um, i think it make will make a stronger credit union overall thank you christy or, or jody did either of you have anything you wanted to add about uh, the board's involvement and role with respect to setting sustainability strategies and managing climate change risks and and opportunities Jody, do you have anything? I, I'm good. I, yeah, okay. I feel like, yeah, that was that was great. Fantastic. Then let's move on. Uh, Jody, what has Sunshine Coast uh, Credit Union done to promote um, sustainability and to help your members and your community with changing requirements and with mm -hmm. extreme weather and climate change events? Yes. So um, we've done a few things. I'll just give a little bit of a high level overview. Uh, but the first thing we did was we went to our members through something that Helen was just referring to, went to our members through the member voice survey and asked them what was important to them from a social and environmental perspective. Then we added those questions in about three years ago. So we've been able to kind of benchmark it. Nothing has changed drastically, but benchmark and then see if anything's shifting. Uh, we do know through that research that climate action is important to our members, both personal and business. Uh, so we have created an eco home loan, uh, which really aims to support our members in investing in solar technology, uh, rainwater catchment systems, eco renovations within their homes, um, so that they can take advantage of those opportunities. Um, that's, that's one product that we've created. Um, and then from a nonprofit collaboration standpoint, we uh, have a community enrichment fund uh, that's grants and sponsorships for community nonprofits. And really what we're trying to do is align those six goals that we're focused on, including climate action, to where we dedicate our funds because our members have told us that these things are important to them. And so we're working with a particular nonprofit in the community right now that's focused on food security and they have great community gardens. And so what we've done is funded um, a solar panel system within the garden and then rainwater catchment system within the garden itself so that community members, members can go and check out, you know, how it's set up, what they need to do to do that and replicate it within their own properties. Uh, so it's really coming from that point of um, building capacity, building knowledge, building education 
because our community has suffered from drought and water restrictions. And so being self-sustaining uh, is really important um, to be able to do that and not allow that food to go to waste. So um, this really, uh, again, going back to asking members what is important to them and kind of aligning that. Um, so we know that this is aligned to, you know, spending our money, our members' money, uh, in a really proactive and aligned way. And then just, oh, sorry, go ahead. No, I was just saying that's fantastic. <laughs> and just the final thing with our community partners, we have, along with other uh, funders in the community, uh, dedicated funds to uh, three nonprofits who installed solar panels on their rooftops. And with that, it's great for the environment, um, but also great for the, for the nonprofit to reduce their operational costs over time, which is really important to the nonprofit community. So just a couple of things that, um, that we've worked on. Really, really excellent. Thank you, Jody. Um, Christy, is Van City doing anything different to help your members and, and your community with changing requirements and weather events? Yeah, and I'm really struck by Jody. I mean, like, as you say, you're small, medium, and that's a lot of stuff, right? Like on the product side and the member, you know, and the community support side, that's a lot. So, I mean, it just, I guess, I'm not going to go into all the different activity, operational activities, but just to say that there are so many models out there that credit unions, like so many um, ways that uh, the credit unions are taking action. I, I'm going to tie mine more to um, sort of strategy at a really high level and governance. And to say, I think part of it is to be really, you know, starting with, you know, where you are kind of having an assessment of the members, um, you know, sort of what opportunities and risks are you really facing? Facing for your institution and what are the aspirations of your members what kind of you know challenges every community is unique um, and are you you know setting your sights really on being a leader and if so you know do you have the capacity to, to execute on that um, or is that something you're going to build uh, or I mean I hope none of us want to be a laggard but you know I mean who can afford to be a laggard in these days right I mean there's a pretty high cost to that so, um, so really sort of setting um, the ambitions, I think, of the organization is very important uh, for the board, but also being realistic on what you can be asking of, you know, of management um, and the staff. And, um, and then how do you, you know, how do you um, activate those in, within the strategy in terms of the community pieces, like the support pieces um, versus the product pieces um, and others, like, you know, you talked about employees, um, and other it just really how across the boards everything you're doing how can you bring a climate lens to it and then in terms of the governance does it make sense if you you know are you gonna embed this in sort of everywhere within the work of the board uh are you going to start with you know a dedicated committee or a working group to say you know how do we kind of push this out into uh, our governance models um and then i would say there's also the piece that is so advantageous for credit unions, which is really that, you know, again, cooperative principle of collaboration, you know, we are all fundamentally, fundamentally, you know, you know, value um, within our structures and our commitments as, as cooperatives uh, to work together and work with others. And this is some heavy lifting. I mean, this is some stuff that is not easy <laughs> um, with all the things that, you know, you need to do uh, in running essentially, you know, in a financial institution. Um, and so what, where can you partner? Where can you learn from others? Uh, where, what, where, what can you join? What kind of initiatives? And there, you know, there are so many out there, um, you know, net zero banking alliance we're talking you know specifically about net zero for example um principles of responsible banking you know these kinds of organizations working within you know the system within the credit union system and the cooperative um, movement um all super you know useful for boards to be asking management you know where do we see ourselves within the ecosystem and and sort of the space thank you very much um, Helen, bearing in mind uh, that, as Christy pointed out, we don't want to be laggards, but there's also a lot of heavy lifting. There's a lot to be to be done in this area, and every credit union's journey is going to be slightly different. Uh, from your perspective, obviously, they're the big buckets of, of physical risk and transition risk, but what climate-related risks do you think Canadian credit unions should really be focusing on? That is, um, that's a tough question, uh, mainly because of the, the geographical differences in, and, and the sizes in credit unions. Um, I think uh, each credit union's membership would 
make a distinct difference in what what really matters to them from a risk perspective. I mean, my, my presentation covered the you know the physical and transition risks, um, and then the guide covers it a, a lot. And I don't want to kind of end up repeating myself on this, but I um I do believe that the greatest challenge in terms of physical and transition risks is the need to be structural and strategic in how we implement and think about these risks within. So the biggest risk faced by Canadian credit unions is that we do nothing at all. Mm -hmm. This is the, the biggest risk that, 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 that credit unions can face is that if you don't do something, then like you say, you can either end up being lagging behind, which right now isn't an issue, but when it starts being a, a mandated issue and the laws change, then you're going to, to face problems, uh, litigation or legal problems. Um, but it's you're just not going to be there for the members. Your your members and your communities, your biggest risk right now is that you don't you don't pay attention to it, that you're not looking at these these physical and transition and systemic risks uh, and opportunities and seeing how great it can be for the credit union to engage in this conversation. Absolutely. Helen, well, thank you. Uh, to the other panelists uh, in, in this order, Bolu, Jody, and Christy, did you have anything you wanted to add about uh, climate related risks that you think should be a focus right now? Um, thank you, Victoria. I think that Elena has answered that question well. Um, for me, what I just want to add is that climate risk threatens everything that we know. Um, it threatens our livelihoods, our finance, business, social stability. And um, aside from even uh, paying attention to physical risk or transitional risk or even systemic risk, uh, I think that for me, um, I mean, or because Canada has taken a bold step by publishing two documents recently, um, the National Risk Dis Disaster Assessment Report and mm -hmm. even the National Adaptation Strategy that came out yesterday, which enforces the, it reinforces the importance of including climate related matters into the organization's operations, whether it's governance or strategy, just as Ellen has mentioned. So, um, Aside the climate change or extreme weather events, um, I think that we should bear in mind that this um, fiscal climate risks threaten everything that we hold there. And so we should pay attention to everything. Thank you, Bolu. Jody, did you have anything that you wanted to add? Um, just something pointing out that was in Helen's uh, paper, just uh, related to concentration risk and that being a unique risk for credit unions that usually focus in on one geographical area. And so I thought that was an interesting and important point maybe for this audience to just identify and bring up. Absolutely. Thank you. Christy, anything that you want? Dude, I was going to jump in there. With <laughs> I absolutely agree, Jody. I think that is such a fundamental piece that on one hand, the community focus that we have in some ways makes it easier but in some ways makes it harder. It makes it easier to uh, diagnose and identify, you know, where the risks are and what they look like and the magnitude of them and those pieces. But it also makes it challenging as we're thinking out on long-term strategy. We don't have, because we're, we have this greater degree of concentration risk, say, than big banks. And, you know, we don't really have diversification as an easy tool at our disposal in the same way. So I do think that that is such a fundamentally important difference and, and just reality for us. Um, and then just to sort of to Helen's point about, you know, we can't do nothing. I feel like, you know, we're still at a stage where it is okay not to have the answers but we've passed the point at which it's okay not to ask the questions. Like we need to be asking the questions and saying, wow, don't know. And neither really do the regulators and neither really do, you know, but we have to be asking those questions and acknowledging what we know and like what are still things to be resolved. And, you know, and yeah, things like scope three emissions and, you know, there's all these pieces that are complicated, but I think we kind of need to figure out, you know, what needs to be sort of in the parking lot, because we just can't be there yet. But that means, you know, but we still can't not have these discussions. 
So we've looked at and we've talked a lot about the, the risks and, and there, there definitely are a number of them, but this isn't just a, a dire warning situation. There are also opportunities. So Christy, do, do you want to continue and talk about some of the opportunities that you see for Canadian credit unions in the transition to net zero? I mean, I, I would say in just really broadly, there, you know, there's you know, kind of all in terms of the baskets. I mean, you know, employees, I think, you know, I mean, I don't want to suggest that we don't always, you know, pay the same compensation as the big banks or something, but I'm just saying there, you know, we have a lot of competition for employees, right? And when we look at a workforce, an engaged workforce, a workforce that brings, you know, their whole passionate self to their job every day, it's because, you know, then they choose our organizations. It's because, you know, people have a feel, they connect with the purpose of an organization. They feel that their work is meaningful, that it matters to, you know, themselves, their communities, their families. And so I do think that having and being able to articulate really compelling leadership around climate um, can be an opportunity with employees and retention and, um, and recruitment. Um, and, and then, you know, I, I, on the product side, I mean, our, you know, our members and our communities, they are looking uh, for products, you know, to align with their values, to, you know, help them mitigate risks, you know, help educate them, um, and, you know, yeah, so I just think as, as things change, there, I, I think you're right, there are lots of opportunities. This is the, you know, this is business of the future. This is banking of the future. And so the faster we can, you know, move with, you know, move in that direction, the better positioned we are. Absolutely. Uh, thank you, Christy. Um, Helen and Bolu, uh, Let's look at, at the credit union scene today and what some credit unions in Canada are doing so far when it comes to their, their climate journey, their sustainability journey, and to combating climate change. So, Helen, I know you look at a, a number of credit unions in your in your paper. Let's start with you. And then Bolu, in her role uh, helping to lead the Community Impact and Climate Action Working Group, will also have some great insights. Well, uh, Bolu would probably be able to... to um add more much more to this um, than than I could um, really just having an overview look and then I, I went into certain credit unions I think Van City really did take a, a massive portion because they've done so much um, but generally I'm, uh, there was a trend in in credit unions and the activities they took and it was you know it was reducing paper and 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 single use plastics and, and finding initiatives to help their employees use public transport or greener transport, which is which is all fantastic. Um, changing buildings and operations to be more sustainable, lowering carbon. Um, a lot of uh, different initiatives with with trading with green green carbon and being able to put kilowatts back in that into the system, which was which was um, wonderful to see uh, some uh, credit unions have also provided sustainable financing so for their members which which is a preferential rate uh, loans that allow members to be able to upgrade their their cars or or their homes <coughs> pardon me to be more sustainable uh, more efficient it's uh, those are the main areas I came across I don't know if Balu's seen anything really really specific I'll hand it over Thank you, Ellen. Um, so you've given the overall uh, view of what credit unions currently do. So I'll just go into some specific examples. Um, so under renewable energy, I know that Asinivoin is the first carbon neutral credit union in Manitoba. And for over 10 years now, they've been recognized as one of Canada's greenest employers. And this is massive because um, there are some smaller initiatives that they do, aside being carbon neutral. So they recycle about 97% of their paper, which is about 40% more efficient than an average office. Um, in terms of waste reduction, they do staff composting program, they do car friendly cities and all those other things. I, I think that um, aside sustainable financing as well, being able to provide uh, products. Um, I know that Van City has um, the planet-wise products that are designed to help members take action in so many affordable ways, whether in transportation or um, renovation. 
there are some, there's um, one key thing that Vansity does that I like, which is the home energy advice, um, where they help members in terms of providing advice to, um, in quotes, going green in, in their own households, um, which is really, really, it just goes back to the cooperative principles that we have. Um, lastly, one of the things that I want to point out as well that credit unions do is the, in terms of the cooperative principles, the collaborations, the partnerships, the relationships. And I'm going to highlight my work with the Climate Action Working Group here um, because Jody is also a member of that group. In terms of listening into meetings, having um, resources that they that we basically share at the level of that group. I think that we have about 32 members currently cut across all credit unions in Canada. And um, in the very short while that I've been a member as well as the CCUA lead, I've learned a lot in terms of some of the resources and some of the initiatives that are being done. Um, in terms of partnerships as well, I know that some of our credit unions are members or they have joined alliances like the Net Zero Banking Alliance, um, the Global Alliance for Banking on Values Climate Change Commitments. All this in some way helps you to set targets and metrics towards um, climate action. And um, these are the things that they report at the end of the year, whether in their annual report or their standalone um, CSR report. So just those are just some of the initiatives that are being done at the credit union level. Thank you, Bolu. Um, I'm not seeing many questions in the chat, and a reminder to please put any questions you have into the chat. Um, but I'll continue with, uh, with one question that I will open up to anybody who wants to answer it, which is that credit unions, and we, we've talked about it to some extent based on concentration risk. So credit unions obviously operate in different areas of Canada. They have many members in, in industries such as agriculture, fishing, forestry, mining, how can credit unions adjust their strategies based on the local realities of the communities they operate in? Anyone? Okay, so I can go on this. I, I think that um, my experience with uh, presentation at the COPSA level actually would, um, would help in answering this question uh, because we have all the provincial regulators there at the meeting and um, CCUA was making a presentation on climate risk management and what it means for the credit union sector. And um, at that presentation, it was glaring that um, climate risk management is not um, front burner for some of these provincial regulators, basically because of the um, markets that they operate in. So take for instance, Alberta, that um, is heavily, um, the GHG in Alberta is um, much more than all other provinces because of the oil and gas sector here. I, I think that's one of the opportunities that credit unions here in Alberta can do is, um, again, in terms of sustainable financing, green loans, um, having investments um, that actually support um, carbon, going carbon neutral or low carbon economy. Um, some provinces also are heavily rooted in agriculture and it goes back to the same thing about the GHG emissions. So just having all these products being innovative and being and thinking outside the box. Oh, so in terms of um, what products and services can you offer and what partnerships can you can you make happen in terms of the communities? Those are some of the things that I see in that regard. Thank Can you. I just amplify that no, a bit? Please. Like, I feel like I really like how you've positioned that. Like, there's existing products. If you mentioned investments, and how do we take existing frameworks and really just move people to think about, be educated? What are your in what when we have wealth management operations? What what are you invested in? Can you sh help sh people shift to more you know green options? for example, um, but then also just the, the sort of broader innovation piece, which you spoke to, like, how do we think, you know, bigger? How do we really think about how are we going to be financing the future that we all want and need? And what role do we play? And I would just say, Van City, um, our vision, we've got it sort of baked right in is a transformed economy. You know, it's not about just meeting, you know, selling things to members. It is a transformed economy 
economy that protects the earth uh, and then guarantees equity for all. So, uh, you know, it's got to be a transition and it's got to be a just transition. And how, as financial institutions, do we really go about, you know, there's all the small pieces, but then how do we also really think big and, you know, transformationally? Thank you. Um, again, please put any questions that you might have in the chat, but not seeing any, I'm going to open it up to the to the group to ask a, a big sort of closing question. And Jody, we'll start with you, which is what advice do you have for credit unions who are just beginning their climate or sustainability journey? Yes, I'll go quite quickly because I see it's two minutes too. So I have four. Um, really quickly, start with strategy and framework. And I should say we're at the beginning of our journey, so I don't come at this as like, this is all we need to do, but this has helped us. And so hopefully it will help others, but start with strategy and framework. So where on the continuum will you be? What, is it really about risk mitigation or is it about seizing those opportunities? Um, consider aligning with the UN sustainable development goals as a bit of a framework. Mm -hmm. uh, and then your governance uh, framework can actually oversee those commitments. Consider defining your North Star. I talked about the social purpose and how important that was because um, really all those uh, demands and priorities during the day, it's a challenge to get the internal stakeholder group aligned to this because there are so many things going on. So if you have your purpose, everybody is directly aligned to this and really it's a cross-functional initiative at that point. Um, consider starting with your own house first. So benchmarking your own GHG emissions uh, this will give you the basis to walk the talk and make sure that you're mitigating reputational risk. Um, and then finally, just approach complexities from a system perspective and something you were talking about, Christy, in terms of, you know, tracking our own GHG emissions, that's relatively simple. The data comes from our own data source, but when we look at the financed emissions, that is very, very complex. And so if we can work with the system on solutions and data consistency, um, around that, that would be um, most efficient. So keep in touch with the Climate Action Working Group or even join the Climate Action Working Group. Thank you for that, Jody. Uh, Christy, did you have anything you wanted? I, to I would just, that was fantastic. I would just throw in, you know, make sure your directors understand, you know, climate is, considering climate is a legal obligation, full stop. It has to be considered, it has to be documented that it was, it's been considered, and you either already have people at the board who are climate literate, or you need to be recruiting people, or you need to be taking folks at the, at, you know, who are there at the table and really in pressing upon them, they need to, you know, educate themselves because it is a legal obligation, full stop. Absolutely. Thank you, Christy. Uh, Bolu, Helen, anything you wanted to add? Um, I'll just add, um, because fabulous um, pieces of advice from both Christy and Jody. I think that in addition to that, for me, my candid advice is to start small, um, mm -hmm. think big, and also engage your employees in the process because it is, it is not enough for you to say you have the, whether it's the sustainability desk or the climate risk desk, um, everybody has to come along on this journey. So educate your employees and engage them in the process as well. Thank you. Thank you. Hello. Everybody's got such wonderful practical advice um, and I'll, I'll go with a, a more softly, softly approach. And, um, it's it's a complicated thing. Um, I think Christy highlighted before we 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 don't know what's quite going on yet. I think we're all kind of finding our feet. Regulators are not even sure which way we're going to go with this. It's we know where we want to go. We just don't know how we're getting there yet, and it's not a linear process. So there's a lot of information, and I'd just say don't get overwhelmed. Um, and also speak to others. Speak to other credit unions. Speak to to experts. You're not alone on this journey. Just remember that. Absolutely. Um, and that's a that's a fantastic segue into the last comment that we'll make uh, on this presentation, which is, Baloo, can you give a little bit of an example of where credit unions can find some of the resources uh, for those credit unions who are looking to perform assessments on climate risk, set metrics, targets, or get more information? Thank you, Victoria. I, I think that, first of all, um, just as Ellen has mentioned, um, collaborate and speak to more credit unions and you can do that through the Climate Action Working Group platform. If you want to join that, please let me know. Um, 
I'm always available as well for to discuss um, climate or ESG matters. Um, we also have the ESG Resource Center that is hosted on the CCUA website. We have um, so many committees and communities on ESG, but most especially the Community Impact Committee and the Climate Action Working Group. Um, CCUA also offers a lot of um, education through webinars and CCUA campus. We have the bi-weekly CS Community Impact and ESG newsletter that is sent bi-weekly. Um, so all these are resources that can help you in your journey, but most especially the Climate Action Working Group is a good resource and platform for people to learn as much as possible. Thank you. Thank you very much, Bolu. And I see there's a question about whether we've developed a list of, of green products that are available to members through Canadian credit unions. Uh, we'll take a look at that and we'll we'll let the, the system and the attendees know. So with that, because I know we're already over time, a huge thank you to the panelists today. Uh, an even bigger thank you to Helen for, uh, for writing and putting together the guide. Thank you to CCLI and thank you to all of you for participating in, in this webinar. And we, we encourage you to start your climate journey in whatever way works for you and to reach out to us if we can be of any assistance. Uh, the webinar will be recorded and slides will be shared. Thank you very much, everyone. Bye. Bye. Bye.